So we want to make the most of these three hours. We want this class to be, if you will, a truth zone. And for it to be a truth zone with all the sensibilities of popular culture. Meaning, we have to be very careful to not be distracted by anything. We have to be careful not to waste the time that we have. And we want to focus our attention on the subject matter with a sense that we're in God's presence. So once in a while, I'll ask you, don't look at the computer screens. Let's just look at each other and talk to each other. Not all the time, but once in a while, I want to do that. I want to do that at the very beginning of the class, all right? Even if you don't agree, say yes, amen, brother, preacher, come on. And I do like responses. You know, if you want to, if you want to say something, positive that is, uh, when I'm talking, because it resonates with you, it doesn't bother me a bit. Now, of course, if I'm really struggling, you might want to do what somebody did in a church when the pastor was barely able to preach at all and somebody in the audience said, Help him, Lord. Help him, Lord. So, you know, you, may want to do, you might want to do that as well. But I'm hoping that this class will, as I said, be a truth zone. And we have to focus. We have to attend to the subject matter because, as you've noticed, if you've been to the bookstore, there's a lot of material. There's a lot of outlines books, subsequent readings, things to read on the internet. And for many of you, much of this material will be new. I won't ask you with a show of hands, but I imagine a good percentage of you have had almost no philosophy. That will be a detriment. That will be a handicap you'll have to overcome. Now, the way you overcome it is by studying intensely the material. Now, what happens in this class, I've been teaching this now for 11 years. This is my 12th year teaching it here, and sometimes more than once a year, is that if you haven't had very much background in philosophy or apologetics, the first three or four weeks are extremely difficult because you'll be hearing terms and dealing with concepts with which you are not familiar, which are alien and may even seem somewhat bizarre to you. And the material may come at some times at a fairly quick rate. Now, the way to get through that is to be patient. Because what I found is that most people that suffer from this malady, which I call apologetic shock, it usually subsides in three to four weeks. That is, if you start to get the terminology, build up your vocabulary, do the readings, sometimes read the material twice, three times, take it seriously, it will start to make sense. So give yourself some time and give yourself some room to absorb the apologetics shock. Now, let me just mention a few things about me. Not, not too much, really. It's not necessary. Enough of me will come out later in the class. But uh, this is a class that I enjoy teaching. I'm not sure it's my favorite class because I have many classes that I enjoy tremendously, but it's definitely... Uh, up there in the top one or two is probably my favorite class. And it's a class that really comes out of my life. Because when I converted to Christ in 1976, I had flirted with various secular philosophies and uh, oriental worldviews. And when I came to Christ, I knew that I had to change. I knew that I was lost. I knew I had to repent and lead a different sort of life, but I didn't know for, very, for several months, really, that my mind needed to be renewed. Because in the circles in which I traveled, the idea was you leave the matters of the intellect to the worldly people. That is, the people I tended to associate early on were anti-intellectual in the name of Christ. And that was an extremely difficult proposition for me because I spent the first year of college just barely learning how to think and how to understand philosophy. And then when I came to Christ, I had no idea what to do with these nascent skills that I had been developing. And so they really were fallow for several months. And I attempted to lead the Christian life by avoiding the questions that I was so concerned with during my freshman year in college. And so the first three or four months of my Christian life were absolutely miserable. 
I will never be asked to go on the 700 Club and give my testimony because I was more miserable after I became a Christian than I was before. This is not supposed to happen, according to pop schlock Christianity. Now, the reason I was miserable was not, I don't think, because I was not regenerate. I think I was miserable because I was poorly taught. And sometime in the fall of 1976, I discovered, really, the life of the mind as a Christian by reading a particular book called The God Who Is There by Francis Schaeffer, a book that awakened many people to the comprehensive lordship of Christ, the need for apologetics, the need for cultural criticism, the need for intellectual courage and fiber and fortitude. And after I read that book, I was still awfully ignorant and very immature. But I wanted to do what the book advocated, which, to put it short, simply, is to outthink the world for Christ. That is, that secular philosophies and false religions are based on the shifting sands of error. They are not rooted in objective reality. They do not fit the vicissitudes of the human condition. This is Schaefer's basic point. Only Christianity is comprehensively true, applicable, and can be rationally defended. All other worldviews have some intrinsic defect within them. And as I read that, I realized that this really could set me free to think again. To think now with a Christian worldview. And we'll talk more about worldview. So after that, I pursued education. I eventually got a PhD in philosophy, written several books, and so on. But I guess you would say that my ruling passion really is to attempt to speak the truth of the Christian worldview into unbelieving settings and to build up believers in the knowledge of the truth and in the rationality of what we believe and to try to indicate, if not demonstrate, the irrationality of non-Christian worldviews. So, what we're going to do in this class is really at the heart of my life in one way or the other. Ever since I read that book in the fall of 1976, I've attempted in one way or the other, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to, as Schaefer put it, speak historic Christianity to my generation, one way or the other. So my goal, really, for this class is, if you don't already have that passion, to develop that passion and to develop the disciplines requisite for putting that passion into effect. It's one thing to say, I wish I could defend my faith. Or wouldn't it be nice if, when somebody I encounter attacks my Christianity, I had an answer that made sense and was intellectually satisfying. That's one level. The level of desire. But in order to do that, you have to develop certain spiritual disciplines. Now, some people don't view it this way, but study is really a spiritual discipline. This is very important because we tend to think that a spiritual discipline has to be directly related to biblical knowledge. It doesn't have to be directly related. Now, all things should be done for the glory of God. But there's nothing unspiritual about mastering a difficult philosophical argument, either for or against Christianity. If your goal is to do it for the glory of God to defend the faith. Now, while you're doing this, it may be, in fact, unpleasant. It may be uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean it's unspiritual. Years ago, a student was saying, I just wonder sometimes about my seminary training. I spent hours and hours translating the biblical text. And I just wonder if I'm getting anything out of it spiritually. It seems so dry. And I said, Rick, have you learned more truth about God from your study of the Bible in the languages? And he said, yes. And I said, then the Holy Spirit is working in your life. You don't have to have Holy Spirit goosebumps. It doesn't have to feel exhilarating or elevating for you to be further and further convinced and secured in the truth of the faith. So what I'm, I guess, warning you about or encouraging you about 
is that this is not an easy class. I mean, the grapevine around here is pretty good, right? Watch out for Grotheis and Blomberg. The grapevine is pretty good. And yes, I do expect a lot of you. And I won't get to the syllabus for a moment because I don't like preaching out of syllabi. But the syllabus requires papers. A lot of papers. Actually, one less paper than last year. I cut it back, if you can imagine that. There's one less paper than last year. So, to write a paper that shows learning and maturity in the spiritual discipline of study for the glory of God and defending the faith, you have to develop a certain approach to life. If you haven't already, and many of you already have, and so I don't have to speak to you. But the class, and really all of our classes, challenge you to become a more contemplative person. And again, I said, this class is at war with the sensibilities of popular culture. Because in popular culture, you don't spend three hours thinking about difficult issues. You spend ten minutes and you're on to a commercial. You have sound bites, you have factoids, or you have little visual images that communicate almost no truth. Okay, you might call them, uh, not factoids, but uh, videoids or videots. All right? So this class will have exactly one video at the very end of the class when we talk about the intelligent design movement. And that is only because the video presentation captures the argument very powerfully. What I would like you to do is to attend to the material in your books, in the notes, to me and to each other. And they might be thinking, we've got about 100 people in here. How can you have any kind of discussion? It's not easy. So we're all in this together, all 100 of us. But I don't want to simply be dispensing information without some kind of interaction. So if you have a question, put your hand up. I don't guarantee that I will always call on you. We will eventually do some role playing and that will have some structure to it. I'll give you the worldview of a New Ager and of a Muslim ahead of time. And then we'll divide up into groups and each group will be like a team to respond to one, pers- one part of that person's worldview. And I role play being a New Ager and I'm a really killer New Ager. Watch out. So I've written five books against the New Age movement. So I'm a very good New Ager. And I'll also pretend to be a Muslim. I may even just lapse into role playing if, I, if the spirit moves. So you've got to be ready at any time. If I start saying the opposite of what you think is right, I may be role playing. <laughs> or it may just be that you're wrong. Um, <laughs> Okay. So, we want to work very hard to have the proper environment for the class. I've encouraged you in the syllabus to pray for the class, for your fellow students. Pray for me. Pray for yourself. The enemy does not like apologetics. And frankly, the enemy's done a very good job, you might even say a hell of a job, at extinguishing apologetics in the church. You may have read my apologetics manifesto. Uh, apologetics is alive and well in some parts of evangelicalism. And thank God it is. But in many parts of evangelicalism, it's never preached. It's never taught in adult ed. It's never incorporated into evangelistic outreach. And it is not part of the Christian subculture. The best-selling books are not books related to theology or apologetics. So... The enemy of our souls does re- really does not want this class to, su- to succeed and does not want you to master the material and does not want me to present it well in, a, in an engaging fashion. So please, pray for yourself, pray for me, pray for your other students that we would make the most of the time that we have together. Now, in terms of apologetics in the church, let me just make a few more informal remarks A lot of people are saying now, and we'll spend a lot of time on this, well, you know, postmodern people are not interested in rationality and truth, objective truth. They are interested in community. They are interested in various activities that are warm and embracing and inclusive. And postmodern people have no patience for arguments or rational presentations. They are driven by visual images and they are driven by certain types of relational activities. And so, whether you're dealing with people in the church or outside of the church, you should not emphasize objective truth or careful, crisp, rational arguments. 
You may have heard this from various people who are spokespeople for what they might call the postmodern movement in the church, so sometimes called the emerging church, although that's pretty amorphous. The short version of that is all that is a crock. You can fill the crock with whatever you like. But let me give you some ex- just background from my own experience about this. Uh, this year, I was asked, actually by a man in the room, to teach for uh, several weeks at a church in town called Riverside Baptist Church. Actually, to do two services, one at one campus, one at the other campus, to do 14 weeks of messages. And I laid out the messages. About half were expositional, about half were topical. And I would give detailed notes every week. And I found, and I never dumb anything down. I just It's constitutionally impossible for me to dumb anything down. So I don't dumb anything down when I preach or teach or converse with people. And people at Riverside Baptist Church rose to the occasion. This is a kind of a middle to lower middle class, multi-ethnic church, especially the one downtown. Not like you have all professors, uh, professionals. It's a very mixed group. And I start preaching about 40 to 45 minutes every Sunday. And one sermon, I just said, forget about the clock. I'm going to go with Kairos time, not Kronos. And I'll just preach until I'm done. I went an hour. Everybody was listening, turning pages, writing down notes. Afterward, I apologized to everybody. I'm sorry I went so long. People said, oh, we, want, we wish you would have gone longer. We like it. Now, these are the kind of responses I got. And actually, I came back for six more weeks. Five months at Riverside Baptist Church. These are the kind of remarks I got from people. We like it when you use words we don't understand so we can look them up. We have to listen very hard when you speak. But we like to do that. We like to be challenged. People are coming up to me and asking me, well, what books should I read on this subject? Or have you ever thought about this issue? Or what about this issue? I think the most heartening responses I had uh, were from, from teenagers who would email me or talk to me after the sermon and say, I got a lot out of your sermon. They helped me. Sermons helped me. They encouraged me. Or one woman said, I didn't graduate from high school and your sermons are difficult for me but I take them seriously, I read the notes, I go home, I listen to the tape again, and I learn a lot from what you preach. Now, I'm not saying that to build myself up. I'm saying that as empirical evidence, all right, that a curmudgeon professor can spend five months in a Baptist church pulpit and, can, and remain a curmudgeon philosophy professor, and people love it, generally. You know, a few people I'm sure didn't like it, but... Uh, I think that we need to challenge people intellectually with the Christian message. People in the church and people outside the church. And I've also done a lot of speaking over the years in various groups, in Boulder, various other campuses, panel discussions, a few debates, discussions. And up until the present day, people are still asking the great questions. Where did I come from? Who am I? Where am I going? They're asking theological questions, free will, predestination, the problem of evil. How can Jesus be both God and human? They are asking the fundamental, intellectual, abstract questions today in postmodern America. You might be saying, well, you just go to the churches where people are already into that kind of thing. You know, the modernist churches, the churches that haven't gotten with it yet. That's not true. I've preached three times at a church locally here called Scum of the Earth. Some of you may know of it, some of you don't. Scum of the Earth is not your typical church. By any means, last time I preached there, I was greeted by a guy in a dress afterwards who gave me a hug. This is quite a spiritual experience for me. Uh, It's part of the goth culture, you have to understand. But I once did a a question-answer time at Scum of the Earth, and all the questions were the same questions. Questions about ethics, Homosexuality, free will, predestination, postmodernism, uh, the problem of evil, the relationship of Christianity to other religions, questions about Jesus. These are the great questions that people ask and continue to ask. And I've found in a variety of settings, and so have my cohorts, people that are my betters, J.P. Moreland, Bill Craig, and others, that if you go into various settings and challenge people intellectually with a well-thought-out, rational Christian worldview, you challenge them 
you aim a little bit over their head so they reach up and grab it. Instead of just recycling everything from culture with a Christian gloss, people will listen and they will respond and they will ask you for more. So, I have to admit that I am not at all taken by the, the trends in evangelicalism that say, oh, you dare not you know, preach more than 20 minutes. You dare not ever challenge people intellectually. You must use multimedia in all your sermons or else people will just tune you out. They don't. They tune you in. If you know what you're talking about, you have a structure, you have a point, you have an argument, you exhort, you pray, you challenge. People respond to that. I know it. First person. And so do many other people. So I hope that what you will get in this class will be extremely empowering and bracing for you in whatever ministry you are engaged in, whether you go and work in the local church and preach every Sunday, or work in adult ed, or go into a parachurch ministry, or maybe do something else and teach in your church on the side, or whatever you do, go into a secular academic community and be a professor, whatever you do. I hope that the kind of material that we give you will be extremely encouraging to that end. Now, let me talk a little bit again about, about how the class is, is structured and then we'll get into the outline. As a model for teaching, what I attempt to do, and I'm not always uh, successful by any means, is use a method of teaching called jazz pedagogy. Now, jazz pedagogy is something that I made up, so it's pretty dangerous. But I'm a great fan of jazz. And I think there are a lot of lessons and analogies from jazz to the academic life. And in jazz, the musicians have to know the tradition to play together. They have to know the standards. But they have charts in their mind or in front of them. That is, they have a structure for what they're doing. They don't simply get up there and do anything they feel like. But there's improvisation within the form of the music. There's furthermore interplay between the musicians. A good musician, according to a jazz musician, is a musician that has big ears, meaning they know how to listen to the other musicians and respond. If you've ever listened to jazz, you can hear this subtle interplay between like the drummer, the guitar player, with the saxophonist and the drummer. If you ever listened to John Coltrane and Elvin Jones, you know what I'm talking about. At least two or three people know what I just meant. There's interplay between, there's improvisation and there's form, and there's the serendipitous. The one thing I love about teaching, and it will develop more, Lord willing, as we go along, is the surprises that occur in a classroom. The surprises when you say something I never expected you to say, and then I have to think of something intelligent to say. Or I say something I never have said before, because it came to me in the moment of teaching the class or interacting with one of your comments or questions. That's what jazz musicians call jamming. All right. So, what I attempt to do is engage in jazz pedagogy, which means I guess I'm the leader of the group and the music, if you will, are the outlines. And I don't, I'm not hidebound to the outlines. We will eventually get to them. We have so much to do all the time. I'll always be, in a sense, battling the outlines. But there's another very important part of jazz, and that is what jazz musicians call spending time in the woodshed. Now, there's another expression, being taken to the woodshed, you know, being spanked. It's not quite that, but it's basically spanking yourself. So a jazz musician might, musician might say, well, I'm playing with this cat, and I really have to spend some time in the woodshed to be ready to play with him. Time in the woodshed means practicing. So, what you need to do to be prepared to, to improvise and have interplay with us as a class is spend the time in the woodshed, which means read the material. And some of these books will be very difficult to read. Probably the toughest book is the J.P. Moreland book, Scaling the Secular City. Now, what you do with a difficult book is what a musician does with a difficult score, is that you keep practicing with it. So if you're not used to a particular chord change, you play it until you get it right. If you don't know what a sentence means, you read it until you figure it out. 
Or if you've never seen this word before, you underline it, you write it down in a book, and you write the definition out. That's how you develop your vocabulary. And it concerns me that many Americans and many Christians are not concerned to develop their vocabulary because they have been stupefied by popular culture, which has a vocabulary of about 12 words. So again, we're, we're doing battle with popular culture. We're trying to develop our intellects for the cause of Christ. We're trying to develop our vocabulary. We're trying to develop our conceptual repertoire in this whole area of defending the Christian faith as true and as rational. Okay? 